preach the word and share your experience. Don't preach your experience and then share the word. And you know, that may sound like a play on words, but what I really mean by that is not all of our experiences have the ability to benefit others around about us. And not all of our experiences have the ability to open a door of hope or a hunger for others around about us. And so there's some things that people teach and train on that we have never been fully promised. And so it often brings a frustration in people. Like the Bible never does promise all of us are going to the third heaven. Did you know that? And yet there are seminars that teach people how to go to the third heaven. Um, There are conferences that say we're going to see your eyes open so that you might be able to see the angelic. And these are not hokey people. These are, these, are, these are people that love the Spirit of God. They've had an experience, and they want somebody else to have the same experience because it so blessed them and gave them an encounter with the supernatural. But can I tell you this? That I believe God wants all the supernatural realms open to you, but he doesn't promise each and every one of us that we're going to see angels. Does that not, not so? But then there are spiritual experiences that we are called to share. And yes, they have to be founded on the word of God. But it's those things that have the ability to show God's character. It's those things that have ability uh, to show God's principles, his laws, uh, godly perception. It's those things that that cause us to amplify amplify biblical truths and what we're supposed to do when we share those things we're actually giving you a picture and we're creating a hunger on the inside of you to desire to apprehend something similar because you know that God is no respecter of persons and I know that some of you receive knowledge and wisdom and biblical truth, and then you pursue experience, and that's wonderful. Other ones of you have an experience, and then you search out and validate it in the word of God with wisdom and biblical truth. There is not a correct way which one comes first, but we need to know in those environments we're all moving ahead. Is that correct? I happen to be one of those people that Paul talks about. When Paul says, uh, teach and train others that also have the ability to teach and train. I am one of those that God, no matter where I've been in my life, my, my lowest and my highest, he always teaches me in such a way that it, something can be reproduced in the lives of others. And I think that's probably more common than it's not. But I'm also one of those kind of prophets, and not all prophets are this kind. Often what I go through in personal experience is really what God is saying to the wider body of Christ, the church. And so as I share some things tonight, I'm not just sharing about my personal experience. I really believe I'm sharing a prophetic message to you tonight. But I would like to share a scripture that the Lord gave me and that he had me start praying from this scripture. And I'll be honest with you, it changed my life. And so my prayer for you tonight is not that you're gonna get a few tingles of the Holy Spirit or you're not gonna just be touched. My prayer for you tonight is the same anointing that had the ability to change my life is the same anointing that will even be on this story as I share it with you tonight. So can you lift your hands all over the room? Father, I just pray for all of these. We thank you that your words are life. Father, we thank you, Father, that they do uh, uh, cause us to be transformed into your image. Father, I thank you, Father, right now that you are no respecter of persons. And Father, we thank you that you are causing your word to build, create, and break through on the inside of us. In Jesus' name, amen. So do you want to know the scripture that God gave me to start praying? <laughs> it is, it is, it, it was exciting to me. I must have read the scripture for um, uh, every day for several days because I just couldn't get away from it. And I thought, oh, God must want me to meditate on this particular scripture. But then as I did and I started praying out the scripture, I realized that this was a direction of my life for a season. And so let me read it to you. Revelations 3.18, and I believe they have that. Oh, they do have it. It says, 
I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Now, I want you to, as I read this, God at different points had different things stand out to me. But if you could just imagine having a little bit of a one-to-one with Jesus, and Jesus says, you want counsel? I'm going to give you some counsel. He says, you want wisdom? I'm going to give you a piece of wisdom. He says, you want to know what it is you need to do next? Let me tell you. And he starts out and he says, buy from me gold refined by fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. All of those things that would not be what I was hoping for or expecting. You know, the gold sounds good. I just don't like the refined with fire. The rich sounds good, but again, I don't like the fire. I like the white pure garment, but I don't like shame and nakedness. You know, but then he says, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. And that's where I began to pray. So I began to pray this. I don't know for how many weeks that I prayed it. Lord, give me eye salve that I might see. Can you lay your hands on your eyes tonight? Father, we just all pray that together. Lord, give me eye salve that I might see. Amen. Now, I dwelt on that verse And I prayed that verse for weeks. And then the Lord took me to the verse above it. And so evidently I was taking this scripture out of context. Because the verse above it says, Revelations 3.17, says, You say I am rich, have become full, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, I really don't like that scripture. (laughs) I don't know about you, but he says, listen, something's wrong with your perspective. Something's wrong with the way that you see things. And he says, so, this is what follows. So I'm counseling you how to make this right. I'm counseling you to buy from me the gold refined by fire and, and to receive the eye salve. So I begin to pray every day, God, I want to see. God, I want to see more clearly. God, I want a clarity to know what it is you're telling me to be able to do. And I want to be able to see. Uh, I want that eye salve. Uh, It doesn't mean that I didn't see. But let me tell you a secret. We're amongst so many prophetic people in this room because this is very much a prophetic tribe. You all see, you all hear, you all perceive and sense of the Spirit. But no matter how clear you operate in, you know you were made for something more than what you're currently operating. Everyone in this room, when you get done prophesying, because the Bible says we prophesy in part, there is always a part, there's always a portion of us that thinks that wasn't adequate enough, that wasn't uh, powerful enough, or that wasn't detailed as much, because there is a cry on the inside of each one of us, I know I'm supposed to see better than this. I know I'm supposed to hear better than this. I know I'm supposed to perceive better than this. And God says, come and buy. Gold refined by fire. Come and get the eye salve that you have need of. And I be- that's what we're praying tonight. So as I was praying that, God began to open up my eyes with a greater clarity because that's what he does. But I have to say this, I was very surprised by what he wanted to show me because it wasn't what I wanted to see. Okay? So this is what he began to show me. He began allowing me to see the depth of of my own need. I was talking to someone uh, this week um, about a situation that's going on with a child that's getting into trouble and we need to talk to the parents, but the parents really don't want to hear about it. And I thought, oh, I can't understand that at all. And then I realized I wasn't so thrilled to have God show me (laughs) the depth of my own need either. So maybe there's a little bit of that in in all of us that in some places we would rather scoop off of the top rather than to buy the ISAB, rather than to be refined by the fire, rather than to be able to come forth with our nakedness uh, and our shame, take it away and clothe them white. 
And so he began to show me the depth of my own soul. But he also showed me some glorious things that he has done for every one of us. And one of those things that he showed me was the banqueting table that he already had laid out for us in the presence of our enemies. And he showed me how the Holy Spirit has already been poured out to comfort us in all of our places of trouble. And that he is a ever-present help in time of need. But this is where the Spirit of the Lord began to dig a little deeper that was uncomfortable on the inside of me. Because the reality is many of us are not aware of our level of need and without understanding the depth of your need, you could never fully enjoy all that God has for you. So turn to your neighbor and say, if you don't know that you need help, you won't make space to receive it. Okay, now all of us in this room know that the resurrection of Jesus came to make us free. All of us in this room know that he came to give us life and life more abundantly. But what some of us don't know is that the heart of God is so jealous to be able to provide for you and to be able to bless you. The heart of God is so jealous to be able to help you. And the heart of God is so jealous to be able to comfort you, to encourage you, and give you everything that you have need of. You know, when Jesus went on the cross, he says, I did it. It's finished. It's all done. And there's something that we know that that's true, but we feel like somehow it's got to work its way forward in our lives in some way. So God says he's given us everything that pertains to life and to godliness. And that excites me. I don't know if it excites you, but it excites me. But again, unless you fully recognize it, and you know that you have a day-to-day -day need for that, then we're in danger of spending our time, spending our desires, and spending our money on things that do not ever have the ability to satisfy you. Can I tell you one of the definitions of entertainment? One of the definitions of entertainment is to anesthetize you so that you rest by not having to think, pursue, or be focused. I believe that there is so much of the life that we live in today that has anesthetized us so that we don't recognize the fullness of our need. And so we spend our time, we spend our money, we spend our desires upon things that never can really satisfy. Now, they don't have to be evil things. See, most people think, oh, she's talking about sin. No, they don't have to be evil things. But if they don't satisfy, it's like when my husband goes to the Chinese takeaway for me. I like I happen to like those, what do you call the crackers, prong crackers? And Greg calls them styrofoam. <laughs> but I mean, dip those things in a little curry sauce, and you know, I like the crunch, and, and you know, I, I, I get a, a lot of chew for, for, for uh, uh, not so much calories, you know, at least that's what I tell myself. And uh, so, I, I really like it. But sometimes that's what we're doing. We think that I've got to unwind to watch uh, to, before I go to bed, so let me get in a couple hours of TV. I've had a hard day and I'm stressed. Uh, uh, let, me, let me do fast, let me just do fast food. I'm not against any one of those things. I have some of that every week, just not every day, you know? And so I'm not against any of those things. Or, or we just say, you know, uh, 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 I just don't have any strength for the day, so just let me sleep. Let me, let me do something. And you notice any of the things I spoke right now, they're not sin. Or someone to say, you know, I just feel like I'm pouring out and I'm not doing anything for myself. Let me go shopping. Let me do something. None of those things are wrong in their own. But I believe that there's something that is happening when Jesus says, buy from me, I salve, that he is so wanting our eyes to be open to things that have ability to satisfy what is on the inside of you. But again, if you don't know the depth of that need that you have, you won't ask him for that, 
and we end up being anesthetized by life. And you know what that means? You can wake up next year in the same place that you're in today. Look at your neighbor and say, that's not me. That's not me. No, it's not. But I want to give you, I want to give you a, a, a little bit of, share with you some of the revelation uh, that I, that, that, it's gone on in my own life. I was, as I was praying these scriptures one morning when I was in my uh, worship time, and if people re- wonder why they usually can't get a hold of me before one o'clock during the day, uh, my husband, Claudia, and Sterling actually helped me guard my time very well because in the mornings, that's my worship and that's my study and that's my prayer time. And, uh, you know, and then, and then I start my day with everybody else as well but I have learned over the years if I don't take it in the first part of the day it gets robbed from me before the day is over and so it is not about a religious tradition or so many hours that I have to do this it's not about that at all Uh, it's fresh and it's new every day but it is about the fact that that if I don't give it that time it gets robbed. So, so one morning when I was in worship, it was just such a fabulous moment. I entered into a really heavy presence of the Lord. It was rich. It was beautiful. Um, I could hear his voice with a crystal clarity. Um, but he was speaking to me about promises that he had put in my heart. And his presence was there in such a way that it was anointing me with a tangible faith to actually agree with him and those promises that he had put on the inside of me. And so I found myself, here I've been praying, God, you know, give me salve. And I found myself at this point where I was hearing his voice and and his presence was so strong upon me and he was showing me the depth of my own need and I found myself saying, God, I believe help my unbelief. And when we are moving forward in the things of the spirit, whether God is wooing you in the spiritual realm or he's bringing you through his, his word, I believe you always come to a place because it's untried area that you can say, God, I believe, but God, I don't know what tomorrow holds. So help my unbelief. And the disciples prayed that and it didn't bother Jesus at all. So repeat after me. Say, I believe. believe. Help my unbelief. That's a good way to pray. It always keeps us moving on. Now, in this time with the Lord, in my worship time, God actually sent an angel with an invitation note to me. In this invitation note, it was a dinner invitation where he was asking me to join him for dinner. But you know how when you get an invitation, it asks for an RSVP? It didn't ask that. Instead, it says do you really want to come? And so I held this invitation. It wasn't the angel that was astounding to me. It was those words on the page, do you really want to come? And so I answered very quickly and said, yes, I really want to come. But even as I responded like that, can I tell you, I knew I was responding from the spirit and not my own understanding. I knew I was responding from something deeper out of me, and I wasn't responding just with my, my, uh, my own wisdom or my experience or, or even my intellect uh, at that moment. And so I said, yes, I really want to come. But when I arrived at the appointed place, and remember I'm sharing with you right now an encounter I had with the Lord that I believe that is meant for the wider body of Christ. So when I got to the appointed place where we were supposed to have dinner, There was a lot of lights on, there was a lot of dancing, there was music, there were, there was a lot of people noise, chattering going on, and uh, in this vision, I was very disappointed. You know, it would be like if Greg asked me to go out for a romantic night, and then, you know, he brought five other couples. You know, it would not quite be that, that kind of time, and so, you know, I felt this, and, th- you know, that I was disappointed. But then, through this crowd of people, I saw Jesus, and he locked his gaze on me. And I saw the look in his eyes, 
and it matched the anticipation and the delight that I was feeling at seeing him. And I didn't care who else was there. I didn't want to meet anybody else that was there. Everything within me was propelling me forward to go where he was at. And he had come down off the platform and he was maneuvering his way as quickly around the people to be able to get to me. And I was just so excited because he was coming toward me and it was so evident he was happy to see me. Isn't that good? I, I, it was it was this precious time, and you said, Sharon, that doesn't sound so deep at all. You know, um, uh, you know, it sounds like a good experience. But what did that do for you? When he got next to my side, this is what he said for me. He says, he said to me, he says, Sharon, this is what your spirit longs for. Remember what I said? God, give me eye salve so I can see. And he said, I'm going to show you the depth of your need. And now he's saying, Sharon, this is what your spirit longs for. Let me go on. And he went on to tell me, he says, you judge yourself wrongly. He says, you sing it, but you don't actually believe that you want me above all else. He says, you think your desires are not fully for me. He says, you judge yourself that you're not passionate enough. You're not focused enough. You're not on fire enough. You're not diligent enough. You're not hungry enough. You're not single-minded enough. He says, you judge me as that way. But see, what God was doing was he was revealing to me was that my spirit was absolutely longing for nothing more than him, for fellowship and intimacy with him. There was nothing wrong with my spirit. It absolutely desired him with everything that I had. You know, when you became born again, you know, there was that crave you know, on the inside of you that craves intimacy uh, with God. You long for him uh, more than you could possibly know, and that's such a glorious thought. And this is simple truth I'm sharing with you tonight, and then we're going to minister. But we get deceived in this world. And the easiest deception that we take on is self-deception. And in the area of self-deception, um, we don't always see what our real need is. Some of us think our need is for a bigger house, a bigger car, a better job. I think it's God likes for you to have a bigger house, a better car, and a better job. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I'll tell you what, you can live in that bigger house and the soul not be satisfied at all. Some of you think it's the spouse that you've been waiting for for so long. I can tell you that, you know, I have an amazing, wonderful husband. And anybody that doesn't know Greg, you know, uh, 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 you're missing out because he is an amazing, wonderful husband. But can I tell you that, oh, I don't remember how long we were married, but, you know, you wake up one day and reality dawns on you. You know, it's not that you quit loving them or something, but you think, well, I thought they were going to meet all my needs. You know, I thought they were going to, you know, that everything that was crooked was going to be made straight. Everything that was empty was going to be made full. I thought, it, you know, everything that was less than was going to be filled up. I thought everything that had need was no longer going to have need. Everything that needed, 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 it wasn't going to be there. Something must be wrong with Greg. Did you know any one of you that's married could have got up and said that story? <laughs> because when he says, buy from me, I salve, he's saying, listen, I made you in my image, and I know what is going to satisfy you. And I have put a spirit in you that is so passionate for me that you don't even have full revelation of. And you have this wild, passionate, fiery, hungry, focused, diligent, faith-filled spirit on the inside of you that you have tried to tame and rain down. 
He says, and this isn't even how I made you. Let me show you the depth of your need. Let me show you where you're blind and where you're wretched. Let me show you how you're doing it in your own strength. Let me get Saul's armor off of you and release you to be exactly who you really are. And let's see how you change the world and how the situations in your life come into another level of change and faith and manifestation. See, I actually believe there's a cry in your heart, and you are crying out to be intertwined with him. You're crying out to walk with him. You're crying out to talk with him. You're crying out to see accurately and precisely. But that self-deception, no, that's not how we see ourselves. We say, I could do better. Oh, I just heard Sharon. She prays and worships in the morning and studies. See, that's, that's, that, that's why I don't get to see as well as she does. No, that's not what the word says. He says, buy from me. I'm the source here. And the first one you're going to see is the depth of your need. You're going to see all that I've provided for you, and you are going to begin to see that you are already that passionate one. You are already that hungry one. You are already that one that I believe is going to change the world. You are already that one. You know, the word of God says this. He says, if you pursue the things of the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I believe that it is a camouflage, that it is a hijacking, that the enemy keeps bringing obstacles and lust and different things in front of you that makes you feel like, oh, I've got all these things that I've got to deal with. And Jesus is saying, no, let me cause the real Bobby to go free. Let me cause the, the real Katie to be loose. Let me cause the real Vanessa to run forth right now. He says, drop those things off. He says, those that pursue the things of the Spirit, none of these other things can even attach themselves to you. The eye salve I want to give you not only causes you to see me, it causes you to see yourself, and it causes yokes of condemnation to be broken off of your life. It causes the inadequacy that you feel. It causes the rejection, the betrayal that you know. It causes the expectation that you wanted somebody else to meet in your life that didn't get met. It causes you to realize, I might not get it there, but I get it here. And when I get it here, it is not secondary. It's the highest and the best that my soul was made for. And everything else is a plus. That's a hard thing. You know, I recognize I'm a strong woman. I didn't say I was a controlling woman. I said I'm a strong woman. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I think I, I, I think I made Greg's life miserable for a while. Please don't amen. <laughs> I'm sure he felt so inadequate to the task of being someone's savior, redeemer life giver, need provider, intimacy person, to be all of that. And you know, it, it comes from God, and everything else is just bonus. I lived my life as a single woman, single mom for years, and I knew Jesus was my husbandman. And, and I'll tell you what, he was so good at it, I didn't want to be married. Because I thought it was either or. See, I thought if I got a husband, then all of a sudden Jesus was not going to be my husbandman. And so, really, I, Greg knows what a battle I had with wanting to be married. Because Jesus was absolutely so incredible. He loved me in ways I had never been loved that I didn't want anything less than that, and I thought to have someone else would be less. No, to have someone else in your life doesn't take away what you have to do with Jesus. It's just the plus added to that. So when they can give you something great, when they can't give you something, it's still great. Of course, you pray for it to change, but you're not without because he wants you to know the depth of your need and that he has created a table before you in the presence of your enemy. It's already all laid out. And he says, I've given you everything that pertains to life and to godliness. There is nothing there 
that he hasn't provided. I know this is a simple truth, but I believe that the Holy Spirit is crying out, just ask me for I salve. He says, because I want you to see your needs so that I can come and be your comfort, so I can come and provide you with grace, so I can come and provide all that you have need of, so I can come and provide, you know, all those things that pertain to life and godliness. When I was having this encounter with the Lord, this probably was the first time I really recognized how jealous Jesus was for me. There was such a jealousy. He was so jealous over the fact that I thought a new pair of shoes could satisfy me. He was so jealous over the fact that, that I thought recognition and a bigger platform could satisfy me. He was so jealous over the fact that I thought I could substitute pride in my humility for true humility. I'm not unlike you. But he was so jealous over me because he's the one that made the table. He's the one that laid it all out and said, there is nothing here that, you, that, that, that won't satisfy you the rest of your life. You're not going without. I was talking to someone in Slovenia when I was there last week, and we both have a common friend. Um, uh, um, I just forgot his name. Pa- pastor from China. Yeah. Ung. Um. How do you say his name? Pa- no, Pastor Ung, right? No, Pastor, how do you say? No, Pastor Ung. Aunt Ung, I think is his name. But anyway, if I said it wrong, forgive me, you'll catch up. He's been in prison, had his bones broken. God brought him out of prison, everything. Yeah, that guy. The heavenly man, I think they call him. The heavenly man, there you go. Anyway, we were getting ready to do a conference together in um, St. Albans. And we're, he has to have someone translate for him. And so they had three translators. I think it went into someone could translate into German, and then they translated back into English. And so it was a long time. Brother Jung, there we go. And so it was a long time before we could hear what he had to say. So, so I wanted to pray together, and I thought, how are we going to do this? So we took hands, and the translator took hands with us, and we began to pray. And he began to pray, oh, God, give us the privilege of being martyred for you. Oh, God. You know, don't let us die any other way than to be killed for your name's sake. Oh, God. You know, God, let our lives and our deaths be a testimony to your goodness and your faithfulness. God, honor us to be killed for you. And I'm over there going, no, God. (laughs) No, God. Nope. See, it's not the fact that I wouldn't die for him. I'm just not volunteering to be next in line. (laughs) I don't mind laying down my life, but I'm not going to draw a target on myself and hand somebody a gun. You know, there's a difference in this. So he had just a different concept than I had. But I realized what had happened. And I'm not asking any of us to be martyrs. I'm not even asking you to sacrifice He wasn't sacrificing. He had gained something that he saw us in the West ignorant of. He had gained something that he saw that we didn't have and that it satisfied his soul and his cravings and the desires of his life, and he realized that we were going about life and we were going about spiritual things and that we were missing out on something amazing. We're not quite done, but lift your hands. Father, I just pray for each of us here. Father, this message is, is, is an experience that you want to bring us to a place. Father, that we quit fighting the skirmishes and we start winning the war. Father, this is an a, a, a encounter, Father, that causes us 
to have condemnation fall off of us. Father, that this is an encounter that so shows forth, Father, who you are, and that when we pray for ISAV, the problem is, is we can't see you when we're looking at us. Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus as we ask for ISAV again. Father, we're asking you to change our perception, change the way we see, change the way we respond, change the way we act. But God, this self-deception where somehow it is connected together with this ugly, pious humility that makes us small when we're supposed to turn the world upside down. God, forgive us right now in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> forgive us. Cause us to stand up and be who we are and to be able to see who we are in the name of Jesus. You know, when God asks us uh, to ask for I salve, it's because he wants to be able to satisfy you, but he wants you to be able to see the depth of your need and to see the depths of his uh, 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 solutions that he has for you. And most of us don't realize this. We say Christ is drawn to faith. And the Bible says he does nothing except by faith. But I'll tell you what, he is also drawn to need. And we say, oh, no, he isn't drawn to need. I've even preached messages that I think that's what I said. But it says that he was slain for the sins of the world. That's a pretty big need there. But it's only those that recognize the need for a savior they get opportunity to have the benefits from that. The same is true with what I'm sharing with you concerning who he is, but also who you are. And he says, listen, I got it all laid out for you. There's my banqueting table. But unless you recognize that I've got daily bread, you're not going to sit down and eat daily and be satisfied. You'll be anesthetized by other things. You'll be entertained by other things. But you will, all you'll need, want to do is medicate yourself so that you don't feel the greatness of your need. Let me, let me turn on another television show. I like TV, so that's not a problem. You know, let me eat another slice of pizza. Whoops, that was one too many. I feel a little sick. Because we think more must, must be better. But it's, it's not better. It anesthetizes us when you and I are made in the image of God and there's something so powerful that is already in your spirit, not that you're attaining to, that is already in your spirit, that he's saying, yeah, get some eye salve. I want you to see who you really are. But I also want you to see who I really am. And I want you to see this table, that everything you have need of, everything that pertains to life and godliness, it is already here. Not only that, you get to eat in the presence of your enemy, and there's nothing they can do about it. So we've got to be careful not to feed on stuff that anesthetizes us and forget what we really have need of. Um, I want to share uh, another vision I had. Uh, during this time, and it's kind of personal, but I believe in being open and vulnerable. You know, I was married before, and I was married to a man that was not very nice. He liked lots of women, and he also beat me a lot, you know, so, uh, and then he, you know, he, I didn't even divorce him. He divorced me and left me, you know, so it was a real, it was not an easy, it was not an easy life, but I only say that because I had a vision in the midst of all of this where God is saying, you know, get the eye salve and, and see differently, you know, and I had already forgiven this man, you know, we were divorced, you know, I had, was busy raising three kids and ministry and, and it, that wasn't an issue. But in this vision I had, I was standing with Jesus on top of a hill and he's got his arm around me. And he would squeeze my shoulder, look into my eyes and smile, and my bones would just melt, you know? You just, oh, uh, you know? And I would smile back at him, you know, with this big silly grin that you just thought, oh. You know, you feel like the very sun, S-U-N, is shining on you. And, you know, and then he would look to the horizon, uh, and, 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 and I'd look to see what he was looking at. But he had such excitement, such 
a joy upon his face. I wanted to see what he'd see. And then, you know, he, I couldn't see anything, and he'd look down at me again with that smile and that joy, and he would hug my shoulder, and, and I would just look up in his eyes, and he would giggle, and I would laugh, and then we would both look at the horizon again. And I was waiting to see what he was so excited about. And I could see this movement in the horizon on these little hills. And it looked like something was coming toward us, but I couldn't see what it was. It was kind of low to the ground. And so I couldn't see it, but he was so excited. I was so excited. You know, I was pressing in, and we're, we're, we're excited together, and we're looking. And all of a sudden, I recognized this was a human being. They were on their hands and knees, and, and the knees were uh, bleeding, and the hands were all scratched, and, and uh, uh, where rocks uh, had uh, dug into them. And all that, and this person with great effort was making their way to Jesus, and Jesus was just so thoroughly excited and joyous. And so I was there excited and joyous, and then the person lifted his head, and it was my (laughs) ex-husband. I had bought Isaph so that I could see the way that he sees and not be limited to the way that I saw. We're going to kind of end there tonight. If you're one of those that you have never had an encounter with the Lord for salvation, actually just stand to your feet. And Lexi, could you just come and join us on the keyboard? But stand to your feet all over the room. Some of you are here tonight, and you have never been freed to be the real person that you are. You have never been loosed to know that mighty passion and desire and hunger that God has put on the inside of you and to realize that you are already singularly focused on him, that he's your desire, and that he's created that table with everything that you have need of that will satisfy you. He's told you to come eat. And he says you can even do it in the presence of your enemies. I know most of you. But if there's anyone here that has not already prayed the prayer, Jesus, I want you to come. I have need of you. I have a need in my life. And I have a need for a savior. I have a need for a deliverer. I have a need for a healer. I have need of the identity that you have for me that I've never had for myself. If that's you tonight, could you just slip your hand up right where you are? Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you. Three, four, five hands. Thank you. You know, don't you love it when you don't have to beg people? Six hands. Thank you. Seven. Father, we... We're in a place. I'm just going to give you another second. Another second. Sometimes when we share things that we've experienced, you know what we're doing? We're sharing the goodness of God. Amen. Thank you. I see that hand. Hallelujah. Amen. We're all going to pray this prayer together. Those that lifted their hands and and those of us that have already received Christ are going to pray together uh, with them. Father, I recognize my need of you. And I ask you to come and live in my life. Be the one that brings me comfort. That brings me forgiveness. That gives me a fresh start. I believe you already did all these things for me. And then you raised from the dead. I receive you in my life tonight. In the name of Jesus. And the Spirit of God says, sons and daughters... 
He says, there is an awakening going on in the earth. And many people thought the awakening is a revival. But the Spirit of God says, I am bringing people to awaken to what manner of woman that they are, says the Lord. I am bringing forth an awakening in the earth, says the Lord. He said, it's going to bring, he says, an understanding, says the Lord. He says, that you are my heirs, that you are my ruling heirs, and that you are my hands, and you are my mouth, and you are my heart, and you are my feet outreached to the earth earth and you are now the light of the the earth says the lord and i am going to bring forth an awakening where you have been asleep that you cannot sleep and ignore the greatness that i have put within you any longer says the lord so i am bringing an awakening says god 